Well, hello, good morning, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to a session on the reporting on gender based violence in a heating world. I'm glad that you can um, join us for this discussion with journalists across the world, particularly from the global south, where we'll be talking about the uh, challenges inherent in reporting ethically on the links between climate change and particular violence against women and girls. Now, we know that people around the world are living are already living with the devastating effects of climate change, but it's the links between climate change and violence and climate change and gender based violence that are not so well understood. And this is where we'll hear from our panelists today. I mean, this is partly because the impacts of climate change are multi ordered and they often intersect with other forms of harm, including political corruption and war. And we know that countries in the global south are disproportionately affected and do not have the resources to adapt against future risks. And while the gendered impacts of war and climate are well known, uh, war and conflict, sorry, are well known, the same is not true of climate change. So we will ask, is the international response taking into account the unique challenges faced by women and girls? And how do we make sure that women's rights to economic security reproductive health and safety are not eroded as the crisis grows. We saw in the Kyoto Protocol, the world's first legally binding climate treaty, that it did not include any mention of the relationship between climate change and gender-based violence. Although the Paris Agreement entered force in 2016 does call for gender responsive actions. And when we talk about the gendered impacts, we don't just mean gender based violence, economic precarity, political disenfranchisement and decreased access to education in the workplace are also very real and important concerns for women in climate affected regions. And the solutions too must come from women decision makers, as I'm sure we'll hear this morning. In 2014, 90% of those who perished in the Solomon Island floods were women and girls as well as the first order impacts, women also suffer from increased GBV risks after natural disasters. The same was true after Hurricane Katrina in the US in 2004. And in South Asia, sudden onset climate disasters, including flooding, accelerate sexual exploitation, child marriage and intimate partner violence. Today, we're going to hear from journalists um, from India, Bangladesh, Malawi, Fiji, Samoa, Papua New Guinea, and think about how women and girls are impacted. Um, we'll also think about, as journalists, what we can do better to ensure the public is informed and are aware of the links um, and share lessons and tips from our own reporting. Um, so with that, I would love to um, introduce Taslima Akhtar, who's um, a project coordinator with ActionAid in Bangladesh. And I know she has some really relevant particular experience working with um, women in cyclone affected areas and working on GBV pre prevention. So we'd love to hear from you, Taslima. Thank you, Kathy. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, it's to me to represent the voice of community of the uh, affected areas people like um, due to climate change like coastal areas and also flood affected areas so you know bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable area due to climate change and um, this is it makes double burden on women and children especially uh, on the women and children in affected areas um, if you uh, consider uh, the uh, environmental degradation and the st uh, stress on ecosystem that is increasing uh, gradually in Bangladesh and which creates the scarcity of and stress in people and uh, the in, in different evidence of Bangladesh, it shows that uh, the environmental pressure increasing the gender based violence um, day by day. So if you consider the geographical location of Bangladesh, uh, we, have, we had 22 disaster prone districts due to climate change, but it, is, it has been increased up to 41. Now we have 41 uh, disaster prone so, uh, districts. Districts means it's like sub-state. 
So if you consider the northern west part, this is the flood affected areas and we are facing untimed flood, flash flood. Uh, the southern uh, east part, uh, sorry, northern east part is the Howard, Howard area and um, flash, uh, flash flood are regular phenomena for these areas. And if you consider the southeast, uh, southwest and southeast part of Bangladesh, here we have issues of uh, um, uh, rising of sea level and uh, every year cyclone, uh, also the tidal wave. Um, in the middle, we have uh, the arsenic problem in water. We have river, river erosion diff in different areas as we have number of significant rivers in Bangladesh and drought also added here uh, in um, dry season. So, uh, uh, if you, if you consider climate change actually making increasingly, increasingly harder time for the um, uh, flood prone and coastal, uh, coastal women and adolescent girls to ensure their reproductive health and tackling early marriage, domestic violence, sexual assault and rape, forced prostitution, um, as well as different forms of exploitation of women. And evidence says, Human trafficking rises in those areas where the natural environment is under stress. If you consider the coastal areas in Bangladesh, uh, salinity invading water bodies, uh, exposing women to diseases like uterus infection, skin infections, complication in pregnancy, urine infection due to scarcity of drinking water, because uh, you know women are reserving uh, water uh, in rainy season and uh, uh, they actually like to sacrifice their need and reserve the major parts for other uh, family members. So uh, due to cyclone and river erosion uh, and also due to flood, many uh, people are forced to live uh, dangerously on embankments or roadside after losing home due to uh, cyclone flood and river erosion. So family uh, try to marry up their girls, stop uh, education, for children, especially for the girl child, because uh, you know, in the South Asian context, uh, we are very patriar we are living in a patriarchal society. So uh, people uh, just treated the girl child as, as their family burden, uh, uh, as they are used to, as they have to live in the embankment. They have several issues of insecurity, like uh, fair, uh, scarcity of uh, facing sexual harassment. Hygiene issue is a very important issue in there because uh, you know uh, the people who are living in, on embankment they actually use the open toilet and for seven to six families they use one toilet and you know in Bangladesh uh, country context women are not used to go to the toilet in front of any men, men. so uh, they have to wait for sunset and um, the sunrise. Uh, so they use before sunrise and after sunset. So the, here is a uh, major hygiene health health issues here. So uh, in coastal areas, women have to work miles to uh, collect drinking water. Uh, places are sometimes places are surrounded by water, but there is no single drop of drinking water sometimes. And here is the the season already started, and now. Uh, so salinity has consumed everything from uh, drinking water to crop production, uh, so, um, uh, 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 disrupting daily life of um, people due to the saline water. The crisis uh, drives men uh, for the families to go elsewhere in, uh, to search uh, for work, inserting uh, of work, which makes women and girls more vulnerable to several issues. As men, are, as men are treated as safeguard uh, in our society context. And um, the re resulted some men never come back and they are used to uh, do polygamy. And it's very usual to do several marriage for these men because they are being migrated in different places. Uh, and they feel suitable to marry another woman in another place. And the, the, the women who living in coastal areas they are actually the number of women headed families are increasing. And so they, these women are overloaded because they have to do unpaid care work. Parallelly, they have to do uh, work for their daily livelihood. 
and you know in 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 coastal areas the wages for men and women are not equal here there is uh, there has a discrimination for women so salinity in which local ponds during storms are uh, surges uh, women are forced to use saline water for their uh, daily works like cleaning like um, uh, washing some uh, and it exposes many diseases and if you consider uh, about the treatment of these women this is also a burden for these families because you know women, women actually haven't any control in their family economy because the decision maker is uh, the men uh, they have to travel three or four miles to collect drinking water which hinders them uh, from doing household works like cooking and cleaning this predicament also leads to domestic violence as males quite often beat their wives for not cooking on time. Uh, here is also has some health issues like uh, women have to carry the uh, wet water pot from three to four miles far. So here is their uh, uh, health issues. Some are um, sufferings from uh, neurological problems due to carrying the wet pot. And um, uh, also burden with, uh, with tasks such as uh, you know, finding firewoods, which are become more scarce in many areas under the ecological impact of our scramble uh, for resources and which exposes them further danger of violence because open place violence is very common phenomena. And uh, like uh, uh, if teasing, uh, we, we actually not use the word if teasing is one kind of sexual harassment according to Bangladesh High Court verdict. So yeah, here is the overall situation. If, if, if you will see the same uh, uh, situation like uh, the people who are um, uh, actually living on the embankment in flood areas. And if, here is a uh, small, small, we are actually uh, seeing the issues of embankment, but this is very relevant to the early marriage because they are uh, used to, uh, they are living in a, um, um, actually it's not a permanent home, it's a temporary home and a temporary house and it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's not built with a strong materials. It's a very temporary and with another storm, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it has possibility to break, break again. So uh, in one place, in one room, uh, seven or eight family members are living. Uh, when uh, the parents are facing this kind of um, uh, situation, they actually encourage to to, um, to organize the uh, girls' marriage because they think if we if we if we can uh, organize uh, the uh, marriage of our girls, it might um, reduce the burden of our family. Um, also, the education of this uh, uh, girl child is very challenging there because they have to travel a far um, to, uh, um, to get access to the educational institutions. Uh, here is the uh, issues of sexual harassment in roads, and they have to use the boat. And uh, like number 40 or 30 people are used to travel in one boat because this is very local, uh, locally constructed boat, not well facilitated. So parents always scared uh, to send the girls to, to use these boats. So they, they think early marriage can uh, bring this uh, solution for these girls. On the other, if you see the uh, other side of the coin, you, you will see women are leading in adaptation also. They are finding solutions the way they can do alternative agriculture in order to keep food at home. They are involved in the uh, leadership process, uh, like at community level, like they are women lead emergency um, response is a very common practice. What actually we are doing, and we are getting a very positive and very significant number of achievements to introducing you know, women led emergency response and community women leadership in community. So we have the uh, both sided of coin. But the other side, what I explained at last, uh, which is very rare, uh, the number of vulnerable women and adolescent girls 
are increasing day by day in Bangladesh because yet we have to um, uh, bring the women and girls issues at the heart of the significant uh, viable strategies uh, the, um, on the climate and ecological issues. So this is the real scenario of Bangladesh. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much, Tazim, for your important points and your insight from the ground, and especially interesting comments about um, the effects of water salinity, which I think we've seen in other countries. And I know Peter and myself have um, done some reporting on these issues in the Middle East. So these are certainly issues that are relevant globally, as well as locally from where you're talking about as well. So I'd love to, on the Bangladesh theme, I'd love to bring in here Shukrova uh, Tazneem, who's currently a uh, global fellow of the Virtues Institute in Oxford here in the UK, uh, but she's also a journalist working in Bangladesh and trying to sort of change the newsroom culture there uh, when it comes to reporting on gender-based violence. So Shukrova, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, following on from Tazneema, and we'd love to hear about the challenges journalists have faced in covering these issues and how easy or difficult it's been for you. Thanks a lot, Kathy. <clears throat> and thanks, Tatsumapa, for a really good introduction to climate change in Bangladesh. Sorry about my voice. I just came out of COVID, so I'm a little raspy. Um, so just, yeah, very quickly, um, she mentioned some things like child marriage when we talk about climate change and how it's affecting women. That's one of the first things that um, kind of come up and it is a story that is being done. But there are, I think, other angles like the health issues and sort of the impacts of migration. These are a lot less explored. So when we talk about climate change, there, the focus is still very much on funding. <clears throat> and like a lot of stories are just on where is the funding going? Is it being utilized? Like it's only very recently that the kind of gender-based ang violence angle has kind of bled into our reporting. And actually the latest International Women's Day having that climate focus has really brought in kind of more stories to the fore. So that's been a really good thing. Um, yeah, so in terms of challenge, challenges, I would say the first challenge really is to kind of make those links. We don't always, when we talk about climate, it, we don't always think about sort of a gender, looking at it through a gender lens. And when we do, it's child marriage. But um, for example, recently, uh, this Bangladeshi journalist called Jasmine Papri, she started doing this series in kind of coastal areas, looking at how health is being affected by salinity. And she has found some really crazy things that you know no one has ever found before. So for example, in this area in, uh, in a place called Shatkira, she found that women were having um, some very serious sort of reproductive um, kind of health issues. And, um, and they were... Um, and they were sorry, and they were um they have very little access to healthcare, so they only go to like very <clears throat> small private clinics maybe because the government ones are quite far away. And over there, they were being advised to have very expensive hysterectomies um, just to cut their uterus away, basically, even though they don't actually need that. They might not. There may be other ways to deal with their issues. But because those ways would require, you know, buying medicine every month. Um, if you're working, if you're earning like 3000 taka a month, which is I don't, like $35, you're not going to be able to spend $15 a month on medication. So people are like, okay, you just spend this um, $80 and you just get rid of it. So, I mean, that definitely, I mean, she was the first Bangladeshi journalist to talk about this issue, but that definitely is something part of <clears throat> sorry gender-based violence and it's not a lens that has been put there before um she's also doing another story now where she found that because of a lack of access to clean water um school girls are not being able to stay hygienic during their menstruation so a lot of the really young girls like 13 to 16 year olds are taking pills to stop their periods and you know with no idea at all what sort of impact that is having on their bodies. 
So there's a lot of like these sort of issues that are not coming up for a number of reasons. A, it's not, they're not the big climate change issues. You know, it's not about funding. It's not about global warming and all of that. It's just very niche, um, like related to women's health and reproductive care and health and all of that. And the other thing obviously is that if you, you know, these women will not talk about these things to a male journalist. They will most def they will probably not talk about these things to a female journalist that they don't know or trust either. So I think the main, like the biggest reporting challenge is to go to these places and actually take your time because these are very like important and complex stories, but you can't do a whirlwind tour. You can't just fly in there for a day, talk to a bunch of people or even two or three days and then come back and, you know, and get the full picture because it takes a while for you to gain people's trust. And um, the other actually a really big reporting challenge, and this is not just for people who want to report from outside, but for locals as well, is connectivity. Like, it is really, really hard. The sort of places that Sasima about, talked about in the coastal areas, um, in shore areas, yeah, which are like kind of islands and the rivers, it is not easy to get to these places. So um, will I be able to share my screen here? Because <clears throat> I could show you a quick map to give you an idea. Yeah, that's fine, but I'm just give you the yeah okay great all right uh, yes, thanks Right. I mean, it's still there. For this week, we want to do what I'm going to do today. Is this just looking at? Sorry, it's just frozen now. Scott oh, okay. All right. Uh, there isn't anything weird going on. Just take a visual look at the faults in question. Yeah, no, sorry. <clears throat> and identify if there's any weird sort of quirks, holding areas. Okay, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Can I go ahead? Hi, Kathy, were you able to see that? Yes, I, I can see that. You can go back to that if you want. It's okay. I mean, I think the problem is when I share screen, my audio kind of goes away so it's just um it's too much effort so I think I'll just go ahead if that's okay but basically um if I could show what I wanted to show you was that on the Bangladesh map if you're in the capital which is Dhaka probably the easiest way to kind of get to the coast is if you take another flight to I don't know maybe Kulna or Borishal um but from there you will definitely need to travel by car there are a lot of places where you won't be able to get by car you need like um, like a CNG, like a tuk-tuk or whatever, if you call that. Some places you'll just have to walk or take a rickshaw. And of course, you're going to have to go on boats and they will not be safe boats in terms of um, a lot of people's standards. Sometimes they'll just be like a little wooden thing with, I mean, they most of them have motors now, so they're quite quick, but you know, there'll be someone like bailing water out on one end while you're sitting on one end. So you have to be kind of ready for that if you're going to go to these areas. But if, I mean, it's impossible to go to these areas if you're not willing to do these things. And um, you also have to be, I mean, it's really important for reporters who come to these parts of the world to know is that you cannot keep a schedule if you're going to like fill it uh, every hour with question, something. Because I guess for example, the last time I went south, I went to this place called Banishanta. Um, where we did some reporting so we had to go to a port to cross the river and by the time we reported we went back and the water had gone down so much that you wouldn't be able to cross that way back again so we had to for another like half an hour travel up river but even then the water had receded so you had to cross to the port in a really in, in like just basically two bamboo planks that are 
next to each other and um, you need to have good footing and you know you need to just be prepared for these sort of things but I mean I think the best thing about working in these places though is that if you ask the, lo the locals whoever it is they will without fail help you you know they will be like oh, okay you can go there oh I'll take you there so I wouldn't say that it's unsafe but it's full of surprises and I think this this lack of connectivity is actually a really big hindrance in reporters going to these areas and actually talking to the sort of people who are most affected by climate change. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's really not something that you can do in a short amount of time. So um, you have to remember that. I mean, the reason why they are for some of the most marginalized groups is because they live in areas so remote <clears throat> that it's really difficult to get health facilities out there. So, you know, keeping that in mind is really important. And um, the last thing I would say is, I wouldn't really call it a reporting challenge because I know there are sources out there, but the thing that is quite often missing in reports on yeah, climate change in Bangladesh is the voice of female yeah, experts. Um, and yeah. I don't know why this is the case because we do have like female you know, scientists, yep, we true. have like female heads of organizations, you know, we have um, who work in these places, you know, Friendship, for example, is one of them. And of course, um, um, there's many, many other NGOs that work there. Um, we have women in leadership positions in organizations like the Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, who people often do go to for um, quotes, but you'll find that more often than not, they'll choose the male expert, not the female expert. Um, and I think it's really important to have the voices of women in when we're talking about gender-based violence and how it impacts climate change. And um, I think my my fellow Bangladeshi Tassibapa also spoke a lot about how women themselves in these vulnerable areas are you know, doing a lot of community organizing and she's absolutely 100% yeah. right. Um, for example, like in, women are really leading the way in Bangladeshi villages on like organic farming and doing things to improve the soil. There's a lot of, also a lot of like young environmentalists, there's like NGOs and other uh, school groups who are kind of doing like community gardens and things like that, getting young people interested in climate change. And there's a lot of young girls and, you know, teenage teenagers who are involved in this and you almost never hear their voices um, even though we're talking about things that impact them directly so I think that's a really really big change that we have to make um, and yeah I, I just want to end with the fact that you know Bangladesh is a country that's a delta we've got we're called the land of rivers so um, we've kind of seasonal flooding and cyclones and these sort of things are kind of a part of people's lives who live in these areas, but obviously because of climate change, they've become far more frequent and more extreme um, and their resilience is being really, really tested, but people are extremely resilient, even though they are vulnerable. And I think it's really important to show both sides of those, both that their vulnerabilities as well as their resilience to get a complete picture about women and climate change and all of this. Thank you very much, Shikana. That was um, really interesting to hear about, especially following on from Tess Neighbor and about the, the work that women are doing on the grassroots level, particularly in organic farming, tackling climate change issues. Um, and there were some good tips in there as well for us as reporters about connectivity um, and about that balance between resilience and uh, vulnerability, which I think is always hard to get right as a journalist because you don't want to stereotype one way or the other. Um, I think that's a really great picture we've had from Bangladesh. I'm happy that we could have uh, two experts like yourselves. Uh, I'd like to go to Peter now. Peter Schwartzstein is um, an environmental journalist who covers a uh, topic all around the world based in Athens. And I think Peter's going to talk us through the relationship between climate change and violence and about the, the latest uh, conversations around that and also how that relates to gender based violence. So we'd love to hear from you, Peter, if that's okay. So, thanks, Kathy. And um, it's very nice to, to meet 
the rest of you. Um, uh, like Shoprova, I'm in the, the midst of this COVID thing, and so feel like hell, um, and will as a consequence keep my um, remarks um, even briefer than I otherwise planned. Um, as as Kathy said, I'm a, um, a climate and environment person with very limited background in, in gender-based violence, but what I'm going to try and do in a if kind of very non-exhaustive manner is just try and position uh, gender-based violence a little bit more um, in a kind of global context of, of climate violence, um, and also just illustrate a little bit more um, about how climate change kind of creates environments in which gender-based violence can become um, even, even more likely. Um, so, I mean, as uh, Taslima and, and Shoprova have, have already sort of alluded to, um, something that almost always hits women even harder than, than others. Um, and as climate change uh, bites to a kind of even deeper extent than it already has, we're seeing more and more people uprooted from their homes, particularly in regions like South Asia and, and large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and in a, in a security sense, this has huge ramifications. Um, when people are torn from their communities, they're often um, moved away from kind of socially cohesive uh, environments, the kind of social environment that can kind of check, uh, I guess, some of the worst excesses within the community itself. Um, when you're displaced, you're often removed from your kind of wider family or in some instances, tribal support networks and sometimes placed uh, among people with very different backgrounds or very different social mores. Um, when you're displaced, uh, as has happened in, in so many parts of the world, particularly um, uh, the Middle East, the region that I most frequently report from, um, the authorities are, are perhaps less likely to uh, afford displaced people the same kind of protection that they would grant others, that they would grant um, host communities um, and women uh, again, even more than, than men are, are, are likely to suffer from the kind of collective fallout um, from that uh, uh, sort of insecurity or, or, or lack of application of rule of law. Um, and then the very nature of refugee and IDB camps, or these kind of informal urban areas where uh, displaced people, whether they're displaced because of climate related issues or displaced because of other things, um, are very, very frequently um, places of <clears throat> of just rampant insecurity. If we go from the Dadaab camp in Kenya, which for much of the past 20 years has been one of the largest refugee camps in the world, if not the largest, through to the, the Al-Hol internment camp in Syria, which holds um, families of, of ISIS fighters, these places have very frequently been sort of notorious for various forms of, of sexual violence. Um, and the, the ramification of that, of course, is, I mean, if current patterns hold, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more climate related displacement um, and it's very difficult to see how that can be prevented from translating into uh, an even more um, uh, difficult set of circumstances for, for many of the women displaced among them. Uh, then you also have, of course, increased deprivation um, as a consequence of, of climate change. Uh, and this is a particularly pronounced thing in uh, communities that are dependent on agriculture or fishing or pastoralism, the kind of professions that are, I guess, uniquely vulnerable to climate stresses. Now, uh, for the most part, that's a uh, that's extra problematic for women in, in human security terms rather than physical security terms. I mean, in times of scarcity, um, women are, are less likely to receive a, a fair portion of, of water or food, uh, whatever water or food is available, much of which um, uh, goes to, to the men or the boys. Um, and all of this is true, even though there's substantial evidence showing that women's workloads uh, tend to increase even more than, than men's at a time of, of climate crisis. Uh, women's access to education and, and healthcare can, can also plummet as a direct consequence of climate related scarcity or climate related um, decreases in economic fortune. What money is available still at, at that kind of difficult time is just particularly um, unlikely to be dedicated to, to women's um, health needs uh, or, or education requirements. Um, but there is also a security element to this. Um, poverty of the sort that climate change is generating uh, can and often does give rise to more, more crime. Um, I was reporting in Syria for much of the month of October um, and found that everything from sheep rustling 
to um, uh, rape, which was previously a, um, a, a crime that was relatively rare in these kind of very socially cohesive environments had, had proliferated. And then kind of male uh, unemployment or underemployment um, uh, can be, I mean, particularly prolific in, in climate battered rural areas. We have this sort of association um, uh, and as a consequence, um, there can be kind of a, a kind of a direct correlation between between that increase in unemployment or underemployment and and domestic violence, kind of gender based violence. And then one more point on, on that before uh, explaining perhaps how how this fits in 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 richer countries as well is climate change is is contributing to to state failure. And this is in kind of environmental security terms, perhaps the biggest um, climate risk to, to social stability. Um, uh, and it fuels the kind of political climates um, of, of sort of instability in which the rule of law uh, is even less likely to be upheld and which women rights, women's rights are um, uh, particularly unlikely to be upheld and attacks against women left, left unpunished. I mean, the, the nature of climate change um, is that it sort of contributes to kind of reactive ineffective politics rather than sort of, uh, I guess, fostering the, the, the kind of stable orderly systems in which women's rights uh, and security are, are more likely to be, to be respected. Um, and I just want to, to very quickly close before um, with, with, a, with a few thoughts on how, how climate and gender-based violence are, are interacting in richer countries. We often think of the relationship between climate change and insecurity as a a largely developing country phenomenon. And it's, it's certainly true that, that much of it and most of the extreme examples are playing out in, in poorer parts of the world. Um, however, there is a, a wealth of, of anecdotal evidence, thus far, unfortunately, only anecdotal, um, showing that this is very much a thing in, in Europe and other wealthier parts of the world as well. In, in Greece, where I live, we had a horrifically hot summer um, <clears throat> last year. Um, and this led to the according to the, some of the police reports that I've read and some of the police stations that I've been able to sound out to a corresponding increase in reports of violence by men against women. It led to a corresponding increase of um, uh, uh, applications for, for women's shelters. Um, and it seemed that there was a particular correlation between gender-based violence and the poorest neighborhoods. The poorest neighborhoods were those where there was less likely to be access to air conditioning, there was less likely to be greenery. Um, and as a consequence, the temperatures were even higher and, and even more um, debilitating than they were in, in slightly more kind of affluent parts of, of Athens. Um, again, we, we have similar-ish um, records going back to the, the Paris heat wave of 2003, the Paris heat wave of 2019. Um, and so this is an area that, that desperately needs um, additional research. Um, but I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Peter. And that's a really interesting point um, about the relationship between GBV, climate change, heating um, in, in cities like Athens and Paris as well. I think that definitely needs to be looked into. It's something that I wasn't aware of. So I think that that demonstrates to us what good reporting can do um, and how it can reveal things that weren't uh, weren't clear before. And also very sorry to our panelists who are suffering from COVID at the moment, Peter and Shikova, to feel better soon, the pandemic's not over. Um, and I'd love to go to Sherelle Jackson now. And I wonder, thank you for staying up late for us. And I wonder if you could talk to us about some of your wonderful reporting in Samoa. Sherelle is also a former visiting global associate with the Centre for Women's Global Leadership. She's part of our family here, even though we've never met in person. But yeah, I'd love to hear from you about um, reporting on gender-based violence and climate change in Samoa, um, the particular difficulties around that, and maybe some success stories as well, and what international journalists can do to, to facilitate that more. Thank you so much, Kathy. And you can hear me okay? Um, yes, so I, I feel like the, the issue has been covered in in terms of by the previous speakers on the relationship between um, GPV and climate change. Um, so I won't delve too
too deep into to what the implications are on on women and girls as it relates to climate change. But one of the the most um, heart wrenching stories I've covered, um, not so much GPV, but the gender dimension of climate change was um, the cyclone Evan in 2012, which was caused the the most severe inland flooding in Samoa, like an inland tsunami. And uh, during that cyclone, a young woman who had uh, five kids, you know, she was with her children when the flood came through. And there was a point um, during the flood where she had to decide which child to save um, because she couldn't save them all. And that story, like whenever we discuss the the gender dimension of climate change, I think of that story um, of women as primary caregivers and the impact that climate change, the compounding nature of climate change on poverty and on the vulnerabilities of women continue to have. So in Samoa and certainly uh, across the Pacific, um, especially in Polynesian countries, gender-based violence is one of the biggest threats um, to the lives of women. The, the numbers, the statistics speak for themselves. Um, and the overlay of challenges that climate change um, poses on women of the Pacific and girls um, does add, uh, you know, it only worsens the situation um, and it puts their lives in further risk. Um, than it already is. So all these compounding effects of climate change, the really harmful uh, impact of religious um, roles within the family has really put uh, women of Samoa, but also of the Pacific in a very difficult situation um, because not only are you having to deal with the survival of your family, of your community, of your nation, but you're also having to put up with these um, gender roles that you are placed into and with expectations of your husband to take care of the home um, and meet his needs as well. So the situation in terms of reporting on gender-based violence and climate change, um, uh, I, I, I also echo the previous speaker who said there's not so much a challenge um, as it is a proactive approach to covering the issue. So uh, you'll find that in, in Samoa, journalists are not jumping at the opportunity to report on GPV. And if GPV is reported on, it's usually reported on from a trigger-based perspective. So it's usually either as a result of a court case or as a result of uh, an event that's hosted by an international organization or an NGO. But there's not so much proactive coverage of the underlying issues that cause GPV in Samoa. So I think that that is one of the weaknesses that could be strengthened. In terms of how the international community can support, we can always use more research. And UN Women has, been, has done a bit of research in this area, and so there's some good numbers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it can always be strengthened um, in terms of specific data for uh, our islands. Um, yeah, so I think that's some initial inputs. I don't have COVID, but it is very late here. So thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for the opportunity and congratulations to the center for releasing the book. I think it's an excellent resource for journalists and you know, if, if it can be translated, I think it'll be a very good resource for Pacific journalists as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaman. Much appreciated. And I know it's late there, so thank you very much for joining us. And um, I think it's also late where you are as well, Elise. So I'd love to go to you now. I think you're in Fiji. And um, you know, those <clears throat> this, those points made by um Cheryl about trigger reporting on GDP rather than reporting on underlying issues. I wonder if that's also the case in Fiji and you know what's your experience of um, uh, reporting there on underlying causes and what can be done better? 
Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Kathy, and to the center. And uh, thank you to everyone who has spoken before me, especially to my colleague, uh, Lange Puiva, Cheryl Jackson, and to the speakers who have spoken before me. And yes, to answer your question, the situation in Samoa is very uh, similar to the situation here in Fiji. And I think uh, for much of the Melanesian islands of the Pacific, uh, it might be marginally better in Samoa uh, where there's less of a patriarchal society than it is here on this side of the Pacific. Uh, but I would like to go a little bit into what the situation is here in terms of our gender-based violence uh, statistics and um, uh, circumstances before I go into uh, the climate change. And do forgive me, I also am kind of I've had COVID, but not right now. I have a bit of a flu that's uh, hard to shake off, and it is a little bit late here in Fiji, but I, I'm going to ask to turn my video off for a little bit, just so I can look at my notes and not uh, be distracting. Um, so <clears throat> to talk about the impact of climate change of women and girls in, in Fiji and the difficulties that, that reporters such as myself uh, face when we, when we try to shine a light on these issues is to first look at what the situation is here in terms of our gender-based violence statistics. And so um, everyone knows that climate change affects you know, women and men differently. And so uh, because women and girls already face you know, certain vulnerabilities because of the cultural norms that, you know, that keep us in a particular part of society or in a particular part of the home, um, it means also that the kind of economic activities we do the value that is placed on those activities and the opportunities that we enjoy differ quite differs quite uh, drastically from that which you know our men enjoy. Um, and I know that this is familiar to you know to probably everyone here because this is uh, the phenomenon that is global. Uh, but in Fiji, in particular, our gender-based violence situation is um, quite bad. Um, to put it into numbers, about seventy-four percent of all of the women in this country have faced some form of violence or other in their lifetime. About 64% would have faced that violence at the hands of you know, intimate partners. So intimate partner violence is quite prevalent here. Uh, now I've, come, I've covered climate change in the environment and gender for about as long as I've been a journalist and that's going on some 20 years or so. And um, the situation has not changed very much in terms of the gender-based violence situation here. To, so to say in one word, what it's like to be reporting on the links between climate change and gender-based violence um, is frustration. I guess the word is frustration because you 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 look at the figures that that, that tends to increase, and you look at the research that says that because reporting is better, because more women are coming out, because there are more um, civil society action in the area, that it means also that maybe the situation is improving, but then. In the face of the pandemic or in the face of global crisis such as climate change and the severe and frequent weather phenomenon that, that comes into places like Fiji as a result of climate change, you realize in the aftermath that the violence um, doesn't seem to be decreasing, but more, um, more, more concerning is the fact that the violence is more extreme. Whereas in the past, a lot of the violence will be incurred at the hands or, or feet of the perpetrators of this violence, more often than not men. Uh, now there's weapons involved. Now there's prostitution of women and the girl child. And this is something that's become a lot more prominent um, in, in the aftermath of um, the pandemic. And so here in Fiji, we've just kind of come uh, to a better part of the pandemic in the sense that we've had a pretty bad second wave and are now uh, enjoying very high rates of vaccination and are therefore moving away from, you know, from COVID-19 as an issue and, 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 and looking at it from um, uh, other ways or other dimensions. So what on earth does climate change have to do with gender issues? Um, to understand what that means in the Fiji context is to look at what the role of women and girls continues to be in a country like Fiji. And to differentiate that a little bit from uh, Shirelle, uh, to give you the benefit of comparing, you know, what the Samoan example is and what the Fijian example is more uh, alike, is to understand that Fiji is, is hugely patriarchal. Um, 
we're in the part of the Pacific that, that other people like to call Melanesia, um, and that also happens to be the part of the Pacific that's hugely patriarchal. In Samoa, uh, women enjoy a better position in society, uh, and I stand to be corrected by Sherelle on that, uh, but in, in, in Fiji, there's still a huge uh, struggle to get women represented um, in, in national leadership, in decision-making bodies, in policy-making spaces. And so it means too that the, the mainstreaming of gender issues in and around the different work in, 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 in the country, uh, particularly in the climate change work, is still uh, that far behind. Um, so when we're reporting on this issue, like Sherelle says, um, the frustration is in realizing that the stories, the anecdotes, the stories of violence, they're the same. The women, women continue to face uh, extreme violence at the hands of uh, their spouses, their partners, and uh, the girl child uh, or girls continue to not enjoy the same benefits as, say, uh, the, the sons in their family do. And now recent research is showing uh, increased uh, instances of transactional um, uh, situations when it comes to girls. Um, uh, we are seeing increased deaths of, of, of women at the hands of their partners. Uh, last year alone, the year before last alone, there was more than 10 and that's becoming the national average. And these are instances of violence that are very public. Um, we continue to face issues around the glamorizing of, of rape and the denial of rape culture. So when we're talking about uh, looking at the way that climate change um, exacerbates the violence that women and girls in Fiji uh, go through is to look at what it is women do in a typical Fijian setting in the context of climate change. So in Fiji, women continue to, to play a large of the hunter, a, a large part of the hunter gatherer type role. We continue to be the ones that will gather food. We continue to be the ones who will take food to market. We continue to be the ones who will go out fishing, who will go and, and get fresh water sources in those parts of our country that you know still don't enjoy piped water. And so when the impact of climate change um, is, is upon us, like it is right now in, in most of the Pacific and most definitely here in Fiji, where we enjoy a mixture of terrain, we have the flat atoll-like islands, uh, such as uh, uh, that of Polynesia, where uh, global, so where sea level rise is such a huge issue, but we also have you know, the mountainous um, uh, uh, islands. And so what that means is that um, when our villages, when our islands are affected by either saltwater intrusion, salinity, or um, sea level rise, it means that the women go out that much further to get fish. It means that the women go even further away from home to get uh, root crops and vegetables and fresh water. And so when you're looking at a country where two out of every three women have faced uh, uh, gender-based violence, some of it sexual violence in their lifetime. When you look at that in the context of a country where rape is still a very real and very dangerous uh, reality for most women, it means that the further away from home you go to either escape the ravages of climate change or to adjust to it, it means also the further you expose yourself uh, to the dangers of, of um, gender-based violence. So that's really uh, the context in which um, we operate when we're looking at the links between uh, climate change and um, gender-based violence. And then you think about the ways that climate change has an impact on our economic opportunities, on the families and the community's economic opportunities, with resources being that much more scarce, with fish stock being that much more threatened. It means also that the competition for these resources leads to violence like it is anywhere else in the world. And so what does it mean for, for um, journalists covering this? Uh, for journalists covering this issue, it's understanding what the underlying um, uh, um, uh, blocks for gender-based violence is. And it's understanding how uh, reporting on those issues might help alleviate the situation that you're writing about. But when you're a woman journalist 
writing about these issues, you are most probably a woman who has faced violence or continues to live in that violence. And then you're also trying to understand and write objectively about what some other woman is going through and what some what girl children are going through in terms of um, the, the, the gender-based violence they go through and the ways that, that climate change makes that even worse. Um, so I guess the question at the end of this is, um, how do, how do I think it can be made that much better? Uh, like anything else, it's always about um, capacity building. Journalists have to work that much harder to, to understand so much more than I think even I needed to understand as a cadet reporter some 22, 23 years ago when I first came on the job. Uh, we have to work outside of you know, the usual load of five to seven stories a day or the usual load uh, of um, uh, three to four big stories a week just to understand the issues that you're writing about so that your reporting is actually helping the situation and not um, uh, making it worse. Uh, but I think in terms of the very practical ways um, that the situation in Fiji could be that much better, uh, could be made that much better so that journalists can report on this and other issues that confront uh, women, it's always to do with media freedom. If we, journalists can do their work in absolute independence and in absolute freedom from uh, criminalization and without living in fear that um, the definition of what is incorrect or what is criminal in terms of the work we do is um, you know, so wide, it means that we can do our work um, effectively in the virtuity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I also heard that you would be about to say, I'm sorry that you had a flu. Um, those were some great points that you made as well, <clears throat> excuse me, about media freedom, um, the sorts of work that we need to do and how we can go about helping the situation rather than making it worse. So thank you very much and feel better soon, Lise. And um, I hope to see you again. Um, excellent presentation, as Sharon has just said. I would love to go to Margaret now, Margaret Nkroma, who's a, a representative of a Malawi civil society who's worked on gender issues for a long time. Um, and uh, Margaret has some great insights into media reporting in Malawi, and also problems affecting women related to severe droughts that Malawi has suffered for for many years. So maybe we could only hear from you, from you now, Margaret, but uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Margaret. If you can um, unmute yourself. Hello. Am I on loudspeaker? Please raise a finger. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, uh, for this time. Uh, and uh, thanks very much for everyone who has uh, presented before me. Um, I was trying to scribble uh, a few things from, from the presentations. Thanks very much. Now, uh, they, there is a specific area in, in my country that I want to, to focus on for the purposes of, of, of this presentation. And the, that area is in, in the uh, northern part of Malawi. It's called the Waza Wildlife Reserve area. Uh, it's it's a, an area reserved for uh, wildlife, uh, as the name uh, suggests. So it's a protected area legally. But around uh, this area, there are hordes of villages. A lot of people live around this area because initially, uh, these people were actually moved out of uh, the wildlife reserve area itself when it was being created. So they didn't go very far away. That is very normal. So they live around uh, the reserved area. Some live in even in what we call a buffer zone. A buffer zone is still a protected area around the wildlife reserve area, but it's not fenced. But the government just gazettes that this is a buffer zone. So it means if you settle around that area, which most people do, 
uh, if a, a wild a wild animal like elephants, they like straying a lot. If it kills you within the buffer zone area, it's really difficult to claim compensation from the government. So I'm talking about such an area. Now, uh, this wildlife reserve area uh, has got a lake. The lake is it's it's a small lake. It's inside the protected area. So a river flows from that uh, wildlife reserve area from that lake down into the villages. So that's how these people around this area get uh, their water for normal household use and other uses like watering vegetables. Uh, in Malawi, we like growing vegetables close to river banks, obviously, because the, uh, I would like to, to, to irrigate the vegetables, especially if it's not during the rainy season. Now, during the rainy season, like now we are in the rainy season, it's okay. People can get any type of water that they want. They can get rainwater. But as we, we go towards July, August, September, October, November, these months, they, they become really dry and the river that flows from this lake dries up. So uh, the women who are the primary uh, drawers of water in the household either have to choose to go to the river and start digging. So they have to dig depending on the depth of the, uh, the, the river, uh, they, they find water. Or if they want to get that water much quicker, they have to go into the protected area itself. And they, of course, it's, it's illegal to, to wander into the protected area. So there's, there, there have been issues, especially during now the dry season. There have been issues. Most of them are gender-based violence issues now, including domestic violence, where uh, the women sometimes would have to go into the protected area to draw water at 3 a.m. in the morning because the, they said, according to the women, they say that is the time uh, that the wild animals now go to sleep because uh, the, the villagers are not naive. They know that during the day, the animals go to sleep. They wake up at night. So according to them, they, they, when the animals are going to sleep as the day breaks, that's when they go into the protected area to draw water. And the, that time around, there are no game rangers like the security guards guarding the wildlife area. And they are armed for, for your own information. So there are no game rangers because it's obviously it's not working time. So they got to draw water in such dangerous circumstances. And the, should anything happen that they take longer than expected, uh, some of them have faced domestic violence back in the house because the husband can't just believe that uh, a woman had been uh, away, had gone away for an hour or two, just to draw one pail of water. So there have been uh, reports of gender-based violence, men fighting their women because they suspect that you went somewhere and not to draw water. And uh, there have also been uh, reports of some game rangers who uh, stumble upon these women coming from the protected. areas and the uh, okay sorry I, I, I the the line went off just a bit yeah yeah so all these natural resources that the women are looking for in the wildlife reserve subject them to some form of gender based violence in one way or another so there, there, there was one report which, which didn't come out clearly the time I was working in that area where game rangers were accused of sexually harassing. Or having. 
so yeah, some those are some of the issues, and then the spill over effects are many. That uh, where water is scarce, it's the girl child to stay at home and not go to school because the, she has to help the mom to draw water or uh, pick firewood from, from the wildlife, pro, from the protected area or anywhere very far because now all the areas around the, pro, uh, the protected area itself uh, have run out of uh, trees for firewood. So the most, uh, the most reliable place where they can easily get firewood is the protected area itself. So there have been so many uh, gender issues that have come out of that area. Uh, now, I, coming to reporting about such issues, I scoured around the media houses, uh, not all of them, but at least uh, I had interactions with uh, some media practitioners that uh, I know. And none of them so far are aware of any reporter or journalist who has ever taken time to, consist to consistently report about such uh, things and specifically in this area. So that means, uh, the issues that I worked on or that uh, I discovered during the time I was working in this area have not gone beyond the project that I was coming, uh, I was uh, covering that time, that I was running that time. Uh, yet you find that journalists have associations in the country. There is an association called Association of Environmental Journalists that encourages reporting on climate change. There is also another association of journalists that reports on the TIP trafficking in persons, but I'm yet to see any association or grouping of journalists that specifically reports this climate change GBV nexus. Uh, that one I scoured around the media houses, it doesn't seem to exist. So uh, it actually means that uh, there is no specific focus amongst our journalists to report on such issues and consistently. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that uh, there is no one who is reporting. Uh, the media houses that we have do report because I've seen some articles or stories on uh, how rainfall patterns fuel GBV in especially in relation to food scarcity and how it affects uh, girls' education attainment and the, st the stress that comes with the scarcity of water and other economic rights. But uh, looking at the way these issues are reported, you find that they are event-based rather than uh, some uh, deliberate, consistent uh, investigation of an issue affecting uh, women and girls. So uh, this is because I think most of the journalists who report on this are invited to conferences, especially by civil society organizations. At least from my experience working in the civil society organizations, I know that because we would always recruit one or two journalists uh, to participate on a project. And once the project winds up, uh, most journalists would not pick up any issues to follow up on. They would just stick to what we were doing in that particular project. So you find that uh, um, our, our, our journalists uh, or our media houses uh, are not so keen to establish that uh, some sort of permanent structure that can be looking into the GBV climate change nexus. So uh, asking around from the media houses, the most challenging aspect to reporting on the GBV and the, and the climate change is that uh, most of these media houses are based in, uh, I think the first thing is uh, we, we don't really have journalists or the majority of our journalists are not specialists in the GBV 
or climate change. So uh, what most media houses actually do is just to assign one or two journalists that can be reporting on climate change or GBV. But uh, for those journalists, most of them do not have that in-depth understanding of what is GBV. How can I report it? How can I investigate it? And the uh, climate change. And the, in my view, most of the times these are being reported just disjointedly, GBV on its own and then climate change on its own. And where maybe an, a civil society organization uh, uh, attempts to, to, to link the two, a journalist would, would, would report based on, like, on the event that that particular uh, civil society organization is doing. So why is this? It's because most media houses are located in cities or urban areas. And the area I'm, I'm, I'm specifically talking about, just like I think one of the previous presenters said, is a remote area that requires a lot of resources to get there. And they, uh, you have to stay there for some time or some days investigating so that you come up with a, a, a comprehensive report to, to produce. So most, most of our media houses, uh, their claim is that they are under-resourced to, to, to undertake such a, a daunting task, a huge task. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, now, yeah, the other thing is the, uh, because they tend to report based on a, some, some event that's taking place or th that has taken place somewhere, the journalists tend to pick what is newsworthy to them. Now, this is a matter of now attitudes. They tend to pick out what is newsworthy to them so much so that uh, you, they, will, they will end up quoting what was said maybe in a conference room by a GBV expert or a climate change expert. But when relaying it to the public, uh, that information needs to be unbundled. It needs to be unpacked for a lay person to understand. And I think uh, this is where now we need journalists who are grounded in the knowledge of climate change, who are grounded in the knowledge of gender-based violence, for a report to come out that would appeal to the public to know what's happening. And the, uh, the other thing obviously is that, <laughs> that, that I picked out from my interactions with some few practitioners is that uh, the media in Malawi is still male dominated. So it's really uh, difficult for them to look at gender-based violence and climate change as something that is newsworthy that they can report on. Now, again, that is a matter of attitude. Now, uh, when, so when they look at gender-based violence, they look at a topic that is as good as, uh, that can be just as well relegated to the small story section of the, of the media house, because the, that is a women thing in courts. So, uh, so there is need for more female journalists, but not only female journalists, but female journalists who understand gender-based violence, who also understand climate change and the, the interplay between these two topics. Uh, similarly, we also need male journalists, of course, who also understand these two topics and the, the interplay be, between these two topics. So uh, those are some of the issues. And then uh, the reporting itself, uh, because the, uh, understandably, the civil society organizations that are working on, uh, on these topics have got their own objectives, and that is understandable. But then, uh, the focus, in my view, in, in my op own observation, because I take the very much interest in, in such issues when they're being reported in the news, um, my own observation is that uh, 
the civil society organizations would like to present women as the victims or the way. But uh, I think for next steps, if we could also focus on uh, what, what have been the coping uh, mechanisms that these women have been using in the, uh, in, the, oh, in, in the event of this uh, heating world. And uh, as the climate change keeps, you know, increasing its toll on their lives, what have been their coping mechanisms? I, I think uh, as a way forward or as a lesson learned, this would also help uh, in terms of reporting because uh, um, it would bring to the fore the ways that the women are using to cope with the worsening climate change and perhaps that could also influence policy. And that policy can maximize on the coping mechanisms that have been devised by the women themselves to better uh, adapt the environment so that the, um, when, when we are making progress in, in addressing climate change, the, the solutions should have come from the people who are affected by the climate change themselves. So I'm yet to see this side of the reporting, um, this aspect of the reporting. I'm yet to see it anywhere. And uh, yeah, so we need to, to, to prop up our women as game changers because they've survived it all, but uh, we are not interested in investigating how. And uh, the other, I think, very important aspect that I've picked out of all the discussions that have gone uh, before, before this one is that uh, I think we need strong partnerships, either within the media houses or between the media houses and those working in, on, on these uh, areas, GBV and, and, the, and the climate change. I think we need strong partnerships uh, that provide uh, solutions through uh, empirical evidence. So this, this means that uh, there is need for that type of uh, partnership that uh, looks at the media as the, a conduit for reporting, bringing to the fore the issues that are affecting women on GBV and, and climate change but from that in-depth understanding. So it means we would need to cultivate a crop of journalists that are well grounded in GBV and climate change, and of course the interplay between the two so that they can better bring out to the fore the issues that are affecting the women in the country and the, uh, possibly influence policy change because I think that is the, the main reason why we are here. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, sorry, I think I dropped out there. Hello, did I drop out of the mic? Uh, yeah, I think we both dropped out. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, and so I think the end. Did you get to the end, Mark? Yes, I, I, I kept talking to the end and, and I didn't realize I had dropped out. So where did no, I stop? No problem, Margaret. I think because of the time, we need to move on to our next panelists. But um, I want to say thank you very, very much because I think that the points that you made were excellent. And there's definitely um, a place there for some journalists in Malawi to make those connections that you've talked about um, and to really address these challenges properly. And I think you made some excellent points about the problems in the newsroom there, uh, uh, female obviously. So thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Smita Sharma, who's a, a 
excellent photojournalist whose work has appeared also in our head. Um, you guide our GPP reporting silence and emissions. Um, Smita is based in um, Delhi and she's worked with a lot of international organizations. So Smita, I wonder if you could take over that for um, I think you're going to share with us some visual tips on reporting on climate change and gender-based violence. Hi, Cathy. Am I audible? Thank you. So as we have passed over time, I'm going to make this a very short presentation. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, is it visible? Yeah? OK. So um, wait. I'm just going to go to the beginning of my presentation. So um, I've been working on, uh, sorry, just went, okay. So I've been working on gender violence in South Asia and my focus has been trafficking of minor girls uh, where uh, India is a source as well as a destination and Nepal and Bangladesh are um, both sources, which means that girls are brought in from those countries to India. Uh, girls are mostly smuggled through traffickers and through middlemen. So um, the, uh, when I started this project some seven years ago, uh, my focus on, was on the vulnerable girls and what leads them to trafficking. And what I saw was that, uh, you know, the, the impact of climate change uh, that has had uh, you know, on families who live uh, in the, uh, mostly in the suburbs and in the rural areas of both Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. In India, mostly in the Eastern part of the country. Um, so uh, as I started uh, researching more, I found that girls have a very tough time at home, uh, you know, because of the cyclone, the frequent, um, um, very big storms and flooding and different uh, natural disasters. Uh, families are forced uh, to migrate because they lose their houses, their cattle, their farms. Uh, again, some of the speakers have issued the uh, have spoken about you know the issue of salinity on the soil, which is another reason for crops uh, not being able to grow. And uh, once the parents migrate, or even if the parents stay back, they go into manual labor. So it falls, the impact naturally comes on the young girls because they are unable to go to schools. Even if they go to schools, they have to do all the household chores. And uh, really, after talking to, to the girls, what I realized is um, the, the kind of affection that the girls look out for because you know these are families who are just trying to uh you know uh get two meals a day and they get through the struggles and uh, this is what the traffickers are actually looking for they are looking for vulnerable girls you know it's very easy to trap them show them dreams promise them for marriage uh, for better life outside um and just trap them and uh, manipulate them. So uh, these are some of the images that you see, you are seeing on the screen now. These are from the police records of missing girls. So this is a girl from uh, in West Bengal in India who has been missing for three years when I took this photograph and she's still uh, not traceable. And uh, this is another girl. She's from a place called Roop Ganj, which is in Bangladesh. And uh, when I went and met her mother that you are seeing in the frame right now, she told me that uh, two years after she went missing, she called up her mother, one of her relatives from a client's phone saying that I've been held up in, in Delhi in, you know, at a brothel in the red light districts of Delhi, please come and rescue me. So the mother went to the police station, nobody wanted to report on her daughter. So she went to a local nonprofit to say that, please help my, please help me. So the local, uh, uh, you know, nonprofit, they filed the report uh, for her, but nothing could be done because she was still untraceable. So what you're seeing now is some of the girls that were lucky to be rescued, particularly this girl, she was lucky to be rescued before she could uh, be sold to a brothel, uh, you know, and she was a minor girl. So another reason what, 
uh, uh, which I want to um, uh, say is that the reason why I photographed them in this manner uh, is that, uh, you know, there are certain laws, which is like the POXO, which is a Protection of Children uh, Against Sexual Offenses Act. It's a, it's a law that prohibits anyone uh, to identify a minor from any kind of sexual crime. Uh, so I wanted to show the personality of the girls, share the stories, yet not show their uh, faces. So this is how I wanted to show them. But this law is not relevant to Bangladesh or Nepal, but I wanted to maintain this. And this is because of my own ethics and principles, because I believe that everyone must be given a second chance. If the girl has a chance to go back home, she should not be ostracized or any kind of uh, suffer any kind of stigma because they are already very traumatized. So the girl that you're seeing on screen right now, she was uh, trafficked by an acquaintance from uh, Bangladesh, uh, where she was promised a job and uh, she basically went away with this man who sold her off to another man and this man smuggled her to India. So the borders between India, Bangladesh and Nepal is really very porous and it's very easy to get in. Uh, you know, not all the borders are kind of patrolled. So uh, on the screen right now, you're looking at C. Uh, I don't use the girl's uh, real names. I just use the initial. And this is a girl uh, who was rescued just four days, uh, you know, I took this photograph after she was rescued just four days later. And this was a moment that I felt was very you know, heart-wrenching because, uh, you know, when I met the family, uh, the girl was missing and I took a copy of the uh, report and handed it over to the police and they told me that uh, this is a love affair, this is not, uh, not related to trafficking. So I intervened, I, uh, you know, I, um, got in touch with a friend who worked for a nonprofit who specialized in uh, rescue operations and uh, they took it up with the uh, you know with the higher ups and then she was traced four months later to a brothel in the western part of the country in a city called Pune from where she was rescued four months later and uh, again I worked very closely with the law enforcement this is a train station as a woman police officer who is looking into uh, all the uh, security cameras and you know train stations bus stops rivers these are the common uh, modes through where girls are uh, trafficked and when i talk about trafficking it does not mean kidnapping hardly 10 percent of girls are kidnapped as we think because most of the girls walk out willingly with the traffickers unknowingly because they have been brainwashed, they have been shown dreams, they are into some kind of romantic involvement with the men. So here is a police boat which is patrolling and this is the India-Bangladesh border. So a lot of girls from Bangladesh are smuggled to India through the rivers where the traffickers force the girl to swim to the Indian side. And again, this is, uh, as you can see, trains are the most common method of transport, especially in the suburbs. This is a local uh, train station. And on the right is M, who was, uh, again, uh, who got into a love affair with somebody she met at a private tuition class. And this guy took her to Delhi and sold her off to a brothel. And the way she rescued herself was by taking a client's phone, calling up her father and then saying that, please come and save me. Luckily, the police could trace her. So um, this is the guy that you see in the middle is the trafficker who had rescued the girl that you saw previously. So this is the source trafficker. Their basic job is to manipulate girls, look for vulnerable communities. And when I talk about vulnerable communities, these are communities which are suffering from many problems uh, related to climate change, especially related to climate change and any kind of environmental disaster. And this is the last image. Uh, this is a girl. This is one of the first girls that I had photographed when I started this project seven years ago. And uh, uh, when I met her, she told me that she met this guy. He said a lot of nice things to her. He gave her a gift. And, uh, and then she just walked away with him. And then I asked her, why did you walk away with a stranger? You didn't even know him. How could you trust him? And she told me that, you know, he got his parents the parents gave me a sari and they promised to make me their daughter-in-law and give me a good life in Delhi. And he told me that his sister owns a house. She has a shop where I would go and work with him. So this is what I was just trying to convey, you know, the way the girls, uh, I would say, uh, modeled, uh, you know, with dreams and then taken away. 
because they just want to escape a very grim uh, situation. And uh, talking about how I reported, I think I explained about the anonymity and uh, uh, ethics. And uh, certainly uh, a project like this takes a long time to happen. Uh, you know, it took me years to get that access with the police. I was the only journalist who was allowed inside uh, the police station, uh, you know. So it took me almost, uh, uh, I would say three years to get that access with the police. Uh, and similarly, uh, while working in Nepal and Bangladesh, it was similar, you know, nobody wanted to work at you the first time. You need to convince them, you need to, uh, you know, you need to be very honest. I think that plays a big role. So I'm going to end my presentation now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Smita. That was wonderful. And I particularly appreciate your discussion of um, journalists' safe and photographic ethics. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the reasons why it was really important to, to feature your work in our new government book as well. What you say about these women and girls deserving a second chance when they go home to their communities. I think that's really in line with uh, what we're discussing in the book about the survivor-centered approach and how we can um, do no harm as reporters. So I think your work is beautiful, but also a great testament to your ethics. So I'd like Thank to you. thank you to um, our last panelist, uh, Nicole Basso, who's a veteran journalist, um, filmmaker, who's the director and executive producer of Velvet Revolution film um, about women journalists speaking truth to power. So Nicole, very sorry for the technical problems. Really happy to hear from you. Really excited that you're, you're with us now. And I'd love for you to give us some tips and advice on how as journalists we can do a better job of reporting on gender-based violence, perhaps drawing on some anecdotes from your wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy. Sorry to have troubled you with all the tech problems. It was <clears throat> quite uh, unprecedented. Uh, and I, I could only hear Margaret and Smita's wonderful presentations. Uh, but I just want to take a deep dive, you know, into uh, in India, we're seeing gender based violence in many avatars. And um, I want to tell you about the latest one that we are in that is a hijab ban imposed on Muslim girls, you know, and from the southern state where I'm coming to you from today, in uh, today, in Karnataka. This latest GBV assault from communal forces in India, a state government ruled by the nationalist BJP, which is in power in India. And now even the judiciary who has put a ban on Muslim girls wearing a hijab, which is just a simple headscarf to the classroom. The result is social unrest, prohibitory orders, and most importantly, Muslim students, girl students who are rarely in school, their numbers are really low, are now being possibly kept And then, Paul, we're having some trouble hearing you. Is your microphone on? Um, perhaps, Nicole, if you try turning your video off and then your microphone on. Um, hello, Nicole, are you there? No, we still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Um, can you try turning your microphone on and off again? Mm 
Hello, Nicole, can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, great, we can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, carry on. Okay, so all these girls are coming from Avenue. So basically, I was talking about the hijab ban, latest GV, GBV assault, as I call it, on poor Muslim girls who are being told that they cannot go to school if they wear a headscarf. Okay, so they're never going to be able to see a classroom or a blackboard or a teacher again if, you know, we press on with this uh, crazy ban and has been sanctioned even by the high court in the state I am in. <clears throat> we have to see what the top court says. So you see gender discrimination starts with a girl child in India even while she's in the mother's womb. The GBV assault on her begins from that point. In a sun-loving patriarchal society, a girl is not wanted and you know about and I do not have to stress the whole world knows about the sex selection, uh, <clears throat> selective practices that have gone on leading to the genocide of girl children, uh, girl fetuses, and leading to a sex ratio distortion in our country. Um, so, you know, it's, it's endemic and any, uh, the media who take up these issues, um, unfortunately are dubbed as uh, those who are trying to wash their dirty linen in public, they're foreign funded <clears throat> and they work for foreign media and uh, they're basically puppets for some foreign player. I mean, you know, these are things that have been said for years now, not just um, in recent times, but so, uh, the, and this is how journalists are then discouraged from, uh, you know, taking up these issues on a real war footing so that these policies can be changed and there's political will exercise to ensure this GBV doesn't take place. There's also a, gen, a new narrative, dangerous new narrative about uh, a national, Sorry to our attendees, we'll just wait a little. There we go. We can hear you now, Nicole. I can hear you now, yes. Yes, you're back now. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, during the first, you see, one theory that, I mean, we all agree on is that climate change and GBV the real people who are hit on the ground are really the poorest of poor in our, all our communities, in all our societies. And that's, that's, the, that's a basic given. So during the first phase of the pandemic, when millions of migrant women workers in India had to trudge home with their little children on their backs and with their husbands and the little belongings they had in the cities, sometimes walking over to 800 miles, unimaginable lengths, <clears throat> I get breathless if I walk two kilometers and uh, they, they went and, and the nation had gone into a lockdown and they had to walk back to their villages. The assault on their mental and physical health was neither recorded nor compensated. A pandemic had caused utter devastation among India's migrant poor, particularly the women who were left abandoned by the country and the people overnight. Government remained in denial form, their new strategy that is their new strategy saying that there was no distress whatsoever. 
propaganda lapped up by large segments of the compromised media. Now that's very interesting. What is the media doing in all this? <clears throat> uh, this is the, the propaganda is the new weapon and a lot of media are buying into it. The media in India is highly polarized and that is actually exasperating the problems. So is there no one who protested? Was there no space in the media to highlight what pain these women were undergoing? Indeed, there was. Pockets of independent media, largely in the digital arena, where they did not depend on government advertising for bringing out their issues. But there was a price to pay. Soon there were police complaints, defamation cases, arrest warrants, hacking of their phones through Israeli spyware Pegasus, the works against all these journalists, many of whom were women journalists, but they continued resisting and do so even as I speak today, going to the field and covering these very, very difficult stories on GBV and climate change and the assault on the poor, poorest of our, uh, you know, our population. I could go on and about listing the various instances of suppression, uh, but I'll end with just one example because we're short of time uh, on how bad it can get. The brutal gang rape of a young Dalit girl in Uttar Pradesh in a village called Hatras in the month of October 2020 had sent shockwaves through the nation, along with scores of journalists who traveled to the village to report on the gang rape and events that followed which included the authorities burning the victim's body without the consent of the family. A journalist from Kerala in South, A South India, Siddhi Kapan, had traveled to Hathras with four others in a van to report on the story. He was arrested by the UP police on October 5, 2020, with charges of committing sedition under the Indian Penal Code and for terrorism under the country's draconian terror laws, the UAE. Since October 2020, this journalist, that is for the last 17 months, he has been in jail. His wife and her three children are languishing in poverty in Kerala with no idea when her husband will be a free man again. So you see the whole thing is that they are, um, I mean, you know, these, you are doing a job as a journalist, trying to expose these, but it's a huge price to pay in the present climate um, that we are operating in. I'll end it there. Thank you very much, Nicole, for, for speaking to us. And actually, that's a really shocking case that you end up with the case of the, the, the male reporter trying to report on the case of a, of a dialogue that was raped in 2020 in Uttar Pradesh, and that he spent 17 months in jail so far and his family don't know anything about him. So I think that that really underlines to us that the dangers of doing this kind of reporting around the world and how important it is. And maybe that that's something that foreign correspondents can perhaps step up, try and step up and do more on these sorts of stories that are so dangerous for Indian nationals to cover as well. Maybe here we can look together have more of a partnership. Really, thank you for joining us and, and for putting up with these technical problems. Thank you for all our attendees. I really, really appreciate it. I'm really sharing your wisdom and everything that you've learned throughout your career. So, I want to again um, ask you all to look at our GBT reporting guides, silence, and emissions, and pictures available online. If you'd like a copy, email me and we'll send you a copy. And um, I hope to, to see you all soon. Thank you very, very much.